Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Depending on where you're joining this webinar, welcome to LMU's special webinar on global marketing. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. I'm also the director of Center for International Business Education, often called the CYBE or CYBER using the acronym. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education and sponsored by LMU CYBE and Brand LA, a nonprofit organization that supports U.S. global competitiveness through increased marketing literacy. LMU is one of 16 universities in the country that has received the prestigious cyber grants. The LMU cyber serves as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses, LMU Cyber has been offering special lecture series and also the webinars on various topics of international business, such as global marketing, global supply chain, and global talent management. Today's topic is timely and intriguing as increasing number of American companies are expanding their businesses across countries. This webinar will explore how large and small brands unlock new markets and opportunities through innovation and effective brand position. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lawrence Calvers, LMU's Associate Dean of College of Business Administration, and I'm going to ask him to say a few words to greet everyone. Dr. Calvers? Yes, thanks, young son. And uh, I'll repeat, good afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you might be. Uh, I'm Larry Calvers. I'm an accounting professor and also associate dean in the College of Business Administration here at LMU. Our dean, Dale Smith, sends her regards, but to the point of this webinar about the global economy, Dale was just in Dubai as the head of an AACSB program review team, and then uh, I think a day ago left Dubai to travel to Brazil to meet up with a group of our executive MBAs who are on a trip to learn more about the textile industry. Uh, the central theme of this webinar is to develop a framework of centralized, localized, or globalized strategies for firms, large and small, seeking to expand their global footprint. Of course, marketing and branding is but one of many issues when you're selling in multiple locations globally, but they all get interrelated, making this even more complex. You know, what are the cultural and legal differences in the markets? What are the technological and supply chain issues? I'm sure that ultimately global marketing and branding must consider all of these things and make it much more complex than a local or national marketing and branding program. So I have my learner hat on this evening or morning or whatever it is, is it's almost evening here in LA because I'm anxious to understand how businesses of various sizes can grow their brand. Uh, we have an amazing group of people to take us through this journey, including my colleagues, Andy Rahm and Matt Steffel. And we have some great, uh, former uh, students of ours uh, who have actually graduated and friends of uh, LMU. So I'm gonna turn it back to Young Sun to continue the program. And I wanna thank you again for being here uh, this evening, morning or afternoon. Well, thank you so much, Larry, for your warm welcome remarks. Now I'd like to introduce two moderators who will lead the discussion with our panelists today. First, Dr. Andrew Rahm, He's a professor of marketing and co-director of LMU's Transformative M School program, which helps to build future leaders in the creative marketing industry. He teaches courses in adaptive media analytics, and his research examines consumer usage and acceptance of new media, such as mobile and social media marketing. And the other moderator, Professor Matt Stifel, he's a strategist with over 20 years of experience in the creative marketing industry. He joined LMU as a full-time clinical faculty member eight years ago to build and lead the M School program together with Professor Rom. Before joining LMU, he served as executive vice president, director of strategic planning at LA-based daily advertising. He also worked with world-class advertising agencies such as global companies, like Google, Toyota, Nestle, and Bank of America, to name a few. 
And the end, Matt, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. You can introduce our esteemed panelists and you may start the conversation. I know you have prepared a great questions. Thank you. Thank you, young son. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Andy Rome. I'm here with my colleague, Matt Steffel. And we, uh, as young son mentioned, we co-direct the M School program here at LMU and we teach within the marketing department. Awesome. Uh, we'd like to say, uh, say a special thanks to our CBA leadership team, including Associate Dean Larry Calvers, Young Son, Markey, and our Center for International Business Education for the opportunity to bring together such an incredible panel to talk about unlocking new markets and opportunities as it relates to global marketing. And thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar, including our undergraduate and graduate faculty, students, and staff, and our industry friends and partners. In putting together today's program with a truly amazing panel representing a diverse set of perspectives and experiences, we were inspired by the question of what does it mean to be a global brand today in the year 2023? Here's a fun fact. A recent study highlighted that the top 100 global brands rose 23% in value to 8.7 trillion in 2022. And another study that showed global brands are viewed by consumers as possessing the power to make the world a better place. So being a global brand brings great opportunity and room for growth. We are also inspired by the classic global brand management framework of centralized, localized, and localized or hybrid marketing, where centralized marketing means strong central marketing and decision-making where local markets adapt their marketing within strict limits, the benefits of this approach is that it can be the most efficient, it reduces the need to police local adaptations, and it leverages strong universal appeals and truths. But the drawbacks can include a lack of relevance and responsiveness to local markets and insights. And unlike centralized, uh, local or localized marketing is where brands are heavy on the local and light on the global. Uh, the great thing about localized strategy is that it taps into increased preference for brands that are perceived as local. The drawbacks are that it can lead to inconsistencies or in strategy or execution and no clear brand identity. And then there's the hybrid or localized approach with a mix of central and local creative. And so we're going to return to this framework throughout our discussion um, as a, an anchor for discussion. But before that, let's introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have Ivy. Ivy is the founder and CMO of Brand LA. It's a 501c3 nonprofit marketing communications agency serving local and foreign companies, as well as government, education, and small business partners. Let me turn off this share right now. Um, let's Hello, see. Everybody. Hi. Um, it offers strategic consulting services, marketing communications, branding, uh, market research, and PR solutions. And Thank you, Matthew and Andy. Thank you, awesome. Ivy. And then turning to our um, 98 team, not only are Celine, Gia, and Brian co-founders of the Gen Z Agency 98, they're recent 2020, uh, 2020 LMU graduates and former M School, star M School students, uh, so Celine, Gia, and Brian, along with um, their uh, colleagues, founded 98 to be a future-focused global creative agency that creates collaborative relationships between Gen Zs and global brands. And now we're going to hop into the time machine with Todd. We're going to go into the future. Todd's the executive director and president of AI, which stands for Artificial Intelligence, so A-I-L-A. AILA's mission is to catalyze innovations through education, conversation, and collaboration. It explores the impact of AI, machine learning, and other emerging technologies on humanity and creates professional and industry development opportunities through programs and initiatives to serve the greater LA region. And our sixth panelist is Richard Prenderville. Rich is the chief marketing officer at Cannondale, the world's preeminent bike manufacturer uh, Cannondale is one of the world's leading innovators of game-changing technologies and producers of human and electric-powered performance bikes. And I will say, as a kid, I had a huge crush on Cannondale bikes, and so this was like a star-studded cast for me. So, Oh, that's great. 
We're glad to have, and I remember that single, the single fork uh, shot. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> it, 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 cha it changed everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we're really glad everybody's here. Uh, let's get started. Uh, so going back to that notion of what does it mean to be a global brand today? And we'd like to start with, should leaders manage and control their brand with an iron fist, having to put their stamp of approval on every campaign and every asset and every product? Or is that that's uh, centralized management? Is that inefficient and ineffective? And we're going to start with Rich on this one. Oh, great, great, great. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's become more of a harmonized approach to it. You know, first of all, it used to be that it was very ironclad. Um, I think the way to do it now is, is um, design your brand guidelines and, and have everybody uh, sign off on your brand guidelines. So that is your, your marks, how you shoot video, how you, how you uh, show up to consumers. And yes, those need to be held across all of the markets um, and very strongly because when I came into Adidas, uh, Adidas uh, for example, it was just at a change in time. So you think of, of Adidas now, it's, you know, the number two global brand in the world in, in sport. And it was amazing. When I came into the brand, uh, it had just um, came from, from um, almost going out of business. You know, they came to a point where, you know, years ago, they didn't almost didn't make payroll. So, so you can see how a brand changes and, and jumps and shifts, but holding on to that identity and holding on to um, that brand around the world is important. So one of the first things I did when I went into Adidas was I did a global brand consumer research. And it showed that in Japan, people thought Adidas was a fashion brand. In Europe, they thought it was a soccer brand. And in North America, they thought it was a basketball brand. Um, and what we needed to do was harmonize that. And we did that around this, this idea of impossible is nothing, a line that's actually still uh, relevant to the brand today. But it took, took the, the story one step higher and made sure that the universal theme was impossible is nothing rather than basketball lifestyle or, or, um, or uh, soccer. So, so that's one example. I, th I think the other example is, is um, really your first slide. I'd, I'd like to dive into that also because I've had experience both ways. You know, when you walk into a weak brand as I did at Adidas, all the markets had power. There was no central power in, in, in the story. Um, so you really couldn't control the markets um, because there was a lack of fund or they needed the revenue. What I would say is you really need global to determine the strategy and then leave the budget at the markets. So, so have that great global local uh, connection where the markets are spending the money against the strategy and your KPI isn't, your KPI is have you met the strategy? If you've met the strategy, however you do it, that's locally relevant. That's your business as, as a subject matter expert in, in your space. Um, so, so I've kind of found that that's the best way. Global determines the strategy, local uh, executes against it. There is a notion in certain brands, it depends on the size of the brand, whether you need a regional interface in, in between that. You know, sometimes in Asia, South America, especially when you have lots of different markets with different languages. You do need a regional interface, but for my uh, experience, the regional interface was really an administrative role. You know, they kept data and reporting, uh, the interface between the markets and, and uh, global, but really they weren't a strategic or an executional partner. Do, does that add to the conversation? Matt? Great, thanks Rich. Um, let's turn to Ivy at Brand LA. And so Brand LA works with small local, small foreign brands, all the way to large domestic and, and large foreign brands. Ivy, what's your perspective on the, the you know, what does it mean to be a global brand today um, where, you know, a centralized approach means, you know, supreme control, um, but that can be, and a localized approach can be somewhat inefficient and maybe ineffective. 
Um, excellent question. I, I've been looking forward to to actually uh, talking about that. I have to agree with Richard uh, when it comes to the logistics side of managing um, the machine of the brand. So there, there is also a philosophical question that we are posing ourselves these days when it comes to branding, when it comes to global brands. And this has a lot to do with leadership and it has a lot to do with the human aspect of the brand. And, um, you know, that power the brands have to be influencing the world and wanting to make the world a better place um, is actually super important. Um, it's not just to look at brands from the technical aspect of it, but also how do brands deliver when it comes to the challenges they face to become that big, to be that influential? And what kind of skills are needed? What's important? How do we foster partnership with education to actually feed that to our brand for that message we want to put to the world? So my point is, there is a lot of responsibility on the leadership of those brands to actually evaluate what is the mission as much as what is the purpose. And things are changing on a, I would say probably day-to-day -day, uh, events that come through social media with these explosions of influencers and everything can literally bring upside down the perception of your brand just because of something happened in the world today or you know you have to go there pretty fast and and, and think on your feet and, and so forth meaning in order for brands to go globally or be hyper local or be in that harmonized space you have to have in place all contingency <laughs> uh, plans that you can think of meaning you have to be very resourceful and it doesn't matter if you're a startup, it doesn't matter if you're in Mexico, if you're in Korea, if you're in Canada, or whatever you might be, um, from a leadership standpoint, if you really have that goal to become a global brand uh, and, and you know manage your budget effectively, you also have to have that almost altruistic vision that for you to become that and be that better place in the world, make the world a better place, um, you have to have certain things in place. Uh, infrastructure matters, um, leadership matters, uh, resources, where do you put your money? What do you do with it? You know, what, what merits um, growth in terms of fostering the in-house talent that you have, when to outsource uh, certain aspects of what you need. So you have to have your hands on so many different things. I would say if there was one word, there were one word that would summarize what it means to become a global brand these days is multitasking and thinking, you know, massively big uh, is, is, is what we're at these days. Awesome. You know, I, I was um, listening to Ivy and, and Rich. I was, I flashed back to a project. I, I was, I helped a large automotive manufacturer um, and every, you know, every five years they launch a new car in a particular line. And uh, in this, this company, uh, they had enough foresight to know that uh, they had a Hispanic strategy, a Hispanic marketing agency and strategy or Latinx. They had a, a black community strategy. They had a Asian market strategy and then the general market strategy. And they had agencies working on all of this. And what was interesting was that uh, it was tough because all of these agencies who represented these local communities, but sort of a larger representation of the global communities that they came from, even though it was, it was within the US. Everyone said, but our my market relates to this vehicle in a different way. Asian Americans drive, uh, relate to this brand and their vehicle different than uh, African Americans, than Latinx. Um, and what, what I was brought in is as a like therapist, basically between these agencies to figure out What's the common language? And so one thing that we had to do in order to sort of think globally, but to really act hyper-locally on this was what are the common themes that everybody's talking about, but maybe we're using different words so that everybody feels heard. But the other thing that I noticed from that, I'm gonna to get to a question here in just a second, was everybody wanted their, there is identity in representing your locale 
right? And so people want to feel like their ideas are heard and their rep their understanding of their local community um, is represented. So I want to turn this uh, similar thought to 98. 98, you work on behalf often of uh, larger brands who have a larger strategy, but you have to represent that strategy at a local level um, a, among a particular audience, Gen Z. So how does global local marketing uh, impact your day-to-day? -day? And I'll turn it to any, Celine unmuted, the first. Um, great question. Um, sorry, we have talked to between ourselves who's going to take what question. So we were just checking the notes on that. Um, that's a really interesting question. I particularly work as an account manager on a lot of our um, accounts that have global teams and global markets. I think it's really interesting getting to work with global teams, especially in a world where, you know, work from home is such a thing or work from anywhere is such a thing. I feel like today we need to be asking for introductions of like your name and what time zone you're in because everyone is everywhere. Um, it's such a blessing and also sometimes a curse. Um, sometimes you just want that face-to-face -face interaction, but at the same time, you know, you can reach people at any hour of the day at different places of the world. So that is a really, really fun thing that I think we haven't really experienced in the past. Um, I think there's a lot of cultural sensitivity to be included as well. Um, you know, some teams generally have really hard log off times depending on where they are and, and so forth. So it's really interesting getting to communicate with different people um, and being able to like listen to how they approach their markets and being like, oh no, that's different in North America or oh no, that's different in just California specifically. Um, so I think there's a lot of learning to be done when working with global teams. Um, and especially since we deal with marketing to Gen Z and youth, um, it's forever changing and evolving like every single day online and social media. Um, so what trends in one place may not trend in another. So um, I think emphasizing communication um, and just, yeah, constant collaboration is really going to help propel niche marketing in different parts of the world. Can I say something that's a super, super, don't go too far. Look at LA, look at educational institutions in LA and how educational institutions in LA serve international markets while also having the, you know, having the responsibility to serve Angelinos. And that means multicultural neighborhoods. And you have to cater to the more than 250 languages in LA County. And that's just institutions right here. So you, you don't have to go too far or be, you know, educational institutions that are recognized as global brands, but you have the challenge right here, right in our, in our backyard. Uh, how do I communicate my rebranding to, you know, even with a digital divide, how do I communicate to these audiences that I want to serve, but they don't have internet, they don't have, you know, access to the information that I'm going to uh, sort of relate to them. And, and I've, you know, uh, we've been part, our team has been part of major task forces when it comes to, to this, to have a sort of a filtering eye to make sure that language and creative is actually aligned with all of those elements uh, through the same funnel. And it is no picnic, let me tell you that. Um, even huge marketing teams with a lot of capabilities can struggle to sort of fine tune that to a level that the puzzle seems completed, but it isn't. <laughs> so it's a work in progress. There's no magic for anything or, you know, silver bullet for let me get this strategy perfectly right. So. Seems like one theme that has come out over the last few minutes is the complexity, the, the, the need to multitask and really to manage so many things um, at once. And so it kind of, you know, makes me think about the role of technology today. I mean, we have, chat GPT and other AI driven um, chat platforms. Todd, do you see the, what do you see as the role of technology in, in this issue of what does it take to, to build and manage a global brand today? And can, can technology help um, ease the, the need to manage um, all of those moving parts? Yeah, awesome question. I mean, today we're definitely seeing how you know, with the economic downturn and everything, doing more with less is very much the theme this year, right? 
how are we going to, with, you know, a lower, a lower head count on our teams, be able to still accomplish the same amount of work or even more work. Right. And so I really see how AI, especially with, you know, ChatGPT being super simple from a child to, you know, your grandparents being able to, you know, use this tool very intuitively. Um, and people are using it for a lot of different interesting ways where they're like helping uh, write up uh, customer briefs. Um, they're, you know, they're using it for strategy, strategy sessions, a writing partner, right? Obviously, um, I would never recommend using it for 100% the full final product of any type of writing, like a blog or um, some type of copy. But at least it's great a writing partner, like I said, to get you maybe 70% of the way there, where then the remaining 30% is obviously your final touches and your, your massaging of the, of the language. But I think like for the last, you know, everyone's always had this um, idea of personalized, uh, personalized uh, marketing, right? How can I talk directly to that consumer in the language that they, that they know best, right? Localizing that conversation. And I really think that AI has that potential to be able to provide that service. For now, you can have um, one to many and be more direct with the different types of uh, nuances of language within different cultural settings where, yeah, you can use technology like an AI to be able to communicate your message um, without having to have probably a number of different teams that are localized in every city uh, rewriting every, every piece of copy, right? And so whether it's AI or even when it comes to like Dolly or Mid Journey and these text to image type applications, it's also helping a lot of uh, creatives that are not necessarily great at design to be able to do mood boarding, right? Conceptual art, to really think through a concept where I wanna have a hundred of this one, maybe it's a Cannondale bike, right? I wanna think through, right, a new type of bike. Normally it's we take our team maybe a few months to come up with a hundred new ideas, but now we can do it within two days with just a few people getting really, really good at what's called prompt engineering. And prompt engineering for all those at home that don't know about it is basically the way that you communicate with a chat GBT or one of these AI programs that's text-based. It's, uh, you know, how, how good are you at describing what you really want to be able to get the best outputs? And so you're gonna start seeing a lot more skills come up in the resumes for sure of people having chat, um, what's called um, um, prompt engineering as a skill. Um, and it's really going to come handy for the next few years uh, before the next big thing comes up. But um, I don't know if I fully answered your question, but for sure, AI is taking over the world. And if it's not about AI replacing your job, it's about those that do use AI in their, in their personal professional lives that will outperform you and um, they will be taking your job. Thanks. And Matt and I wanted to let you on on a little secret. The title for this webinar came from ChatGPT. So... Um, it has it has played a role in yep. our webinar today. Um, so we're going to continue the the thread of discussion around technology further into the webinar. Uh, in the spirit of inclusion, we thought we would um, ask for some audience participation and launch our first poll question. Mm -hmm. Is it better for global brands to have a centralized, b localized, or c hybrid strategies? Choose one. And then maybe we're able to show the result. And when the results are in. All right. Great. Yeah, I'd say. Mark, you show the show the results as soon as you feel like we've got a enough to show. Here we go. Look at that. We chose the middle. I feel like that is a um, that's always a safe that's always a safe bet. Interesting. Yeah. Awesome. Let's think. Of, let's look at the um, story about taking a global brand to a local level. Um, and the question is, is it becoming more complex to manage brands at the local level today, given all that we've talked about? Um, different, you know, audience fragmentation, technology, um, the different tastes and kind of appeals, not universal appeals, but local appeals that take place, um, you know, at the, at the local level. 
Rich, any thought on that? Like Cannondale, big global brand. What does it mean to bring Cannondale to a local level in your various markets? Well, first of all, I, I think what you have to do and, and, you know, is, is the market has changed in regards to, you know, it was an overall uh, national footprint that you tried to create. And today with, with funds where they are, like you have to pick and choose, you know, your DMAs or your key cities. Like for me in Europe, what's happening in Berlin is driving all of the culture in Europe today. You know, if you look at youth culture, if you look at music and things like that. So pick your key cities and then get underground and, and make sure that you're, you're with the tastemakers of that city rather than the exposed of, of that city. So, so um, yeah, I think it's really important to, to uh, pick your influencer cities. In, in North America, for example, I use the, the uh, tier two Silicon Valley uh, cities, you know, whether it's Nashville, whether it's Austin, those, those cities where the media is a little less expensive, but you have the opportunity to do really special things that, that grow your footprint. So, um, yeah, I absolutely believe in, in key cities and driving that, that local approach. How about, um, 98, Celine, Gia, or Brian, do you have any thought on, have you worked with any relatively larger brands that have wanted to explore or enter more kind of unique local markets? Yeah, um, I think we've approached what local means in a different way. So when we're thinking about social media and how that has influenced Gen Z, it's kind of taken away the normal boundaries that marketing would have had. So we just exist online with less boundaries, like a a Gen Zer from the Philippines and a Gen Zer from the UK who have similar interests don't necessarily need to be targeted separately. And specifically, like what we're seeing with TikTok as a platform is that the content and the algorithm is just less geographically targeted as other social media sites. And so, like, I guess with social media, Gen Zs are discovering for themselves that they are really not that different from their peers across the globe. And so, I guess localizing in a Gen Z context, what we found with our clients doesn't really anymore mean geographic targeting, but more about subcultures and niche communities. So what brings people together online other than where they're from? And so I think social media just gives us easy access into these micro communities um, that we never quite had before. Gia, there was, I have a uh, follow-up question. There, there, there was a trend for a while where there was, you know, localized handles. It was like, I don't know, I'll make up an example, Toyota Philippines, um, and then there would be Toyota USA um, or whatever the brand is. Do you, do you feel like that localization of a social media handle is kind of like going away or when, when is a good time for that? I think that's definitely still relevant. Um, I think what's important, like what Rich said, is for brands to identify what their key markets are and maybe top three. And then, then you'll have those main handles for each geographic location. But the content that you're creating isn't just reaching that specific city and people within that city. It reaches far beyond that. So I think that's something just important to remember when you're creating content for people is that, you know, something can resonate with people across the globe. Awesome. Um, so, sort of keeping along those lines, we have the, the content, but we also have voice, brand voice. And like, for example, uh, an exercise, like a prudent exercise for any brand builder is to look at the competitive set and to sort of figure out what's the, what are the conventional personalities, tones, approaches, manners of your local market and sort of the easiest free way, the cheap way to start to stand out is you just act a little bit different than everybody else in your local market, but it's very competitor specific to how you're behaving in that market. As we span out into other uh, communities, our competitive set changes, the tone changes, the approach. Marketing in Japan is a lot different in terms of tone and manner than marketing um, in the USA. 
Uh, so I'm going to open it up, I think, first maybe to Ivy. Do you have any uh, recommendations on like how do you maintain a, a brand voice or should you even try to maintain a brand voice? Um, awesome. I've been aching to talk about that because uh, we have a lot of engagement with especially startups uh, that have huge aspirations for growth and expansion coming from different parts of the world into the LA market in particular, but also from the N North America coming here and you know you name it. So and, and there is that I'm glad that you know, Gia said that geo ID on social, you know, to call it somehow still relevant because we do see the need for particular uh, consumer brands, uh, in fact. And we've been through the experience ourselves with our team. Uh, we work with the government of Canada on uh, a couple of programs. And some of them have entrepreneurs that, you know, from all sorts of industries, they the only thing they have in common is that they want to come here. And what we found out is through our own primary research as well, that what works in Canada doesn't necessarily translate to the LA market, even if the product um, is the same, or even if the service, um, you know, is, is within along those lines of the same thing. So we usually have those discussions and recommendations, very strategic recommendations to actually explore. Um, one of the many things brand builders have to take into consideration is actually market research and a lot of uh, leaders out there, especially new breed of leaders who are bootstrapping a lot of things, don't consider market research a necessity, which in fact it is. There is a lot of finger in the air strategy, strategy out there that needs to be sort of examined. And I feel that uh, when it comes to cultural translation of how your products persist in a certain market, you have to really think with your eyes on that market. We've occasionally uh, advised leadership of foreign teams, especially startups, to explore having uh, local partnerships to enhance those goggles they need to have to actually understand the market. It's not just doing market research and, you know, uh, coming here every so often or reading this paper here and there, you really need to have your feet here. And that also goes for multicultural content. Um, when you create multicultural content, the people who make up those teams have to have that experience. Uh, we've been ourselves through a lot of uh, process guidelines when it comes to creating multicultural content. Uh, there are a lot of things out there for advertising agencies, especially global advertising agencies that are very, very hands-on these days on how multicultural um, visuals are created. There are things that would resonate with the African-American community that doesn't necessarily resonate with the Hispanic community. And uh, just because everybody's a minority doesn't mean we're all in the same group. And we've talked about that. So th th this, uh, there's a lot of elements, factors that influence uh, that analysis of how do we move that message, which is what we're all talking about, that storytelling. How do I tell the story of my brand to this pair of ears or to this pair of eyes in, that, in a way that they understand it, in a way that resonates with them and that will serve them well? Um, I feel there is work to be done when it comes to um, being analytical. And the more a company wants to grow, the more a company wants to expand, the more intentionally it needs to be to hire the right talent, to foster the right partnerships, to actually get that as good as it can be. Just a quick pitch to our audience members. Um, make sure you input any questions you have to our Q and A uh, Q and A room, and we'll get to them as soon as um, as soon as they come in. Um, speaking of um, brand voice, I think Rich has a question. Oh, Rich, I'm sorry. You know, I, I just wanted to add to that a little bit because it's always uh, either a pendulum or struggle between, you know, the choice of being too heavy handed, centralizing your message and not being relevant to local communities or bifurcating your messaging too far and it gets diluted. And I think I always go back to the Coca-Cola example in 1914. Uh, the lawyers that were trying to protect the marks of Coca-Cola briefed in the new bottle and they wanted a bottle that was unbreakable. They wanted a bottle that you could say, and, and I'm sure you, you, you both teach this in your classes, but that you could smash on the ground, pick up one shard of glass and know that it was the green twisted Coca-Cola bottle. And, and I think the same way, you know, when I, I look at creative work, when I look at anything, I always try to say, 
hey, could I take the logo off of this and know who the brand is? You know, Patagonia is a great example. You always know their photography and their photography has that same style no matter where they are in the world. So, so it's, a, it's a balance of, of, of to and fro to make sure that your brand, you know, can live without the logo. Can I jump in on a quick question here? Sure. I just, here's a hot take question though. So I've worked on a, a variety of campaigns lately. And I think maybe I'll direct this one. This was unprompted. We're going to direct this one to 98. So we'll see where it goes. Um, I worked on a number of campaigns. So as the world has gotten more customized, more targeted, more personalized, we still work in a world of mass marketing media. And I've noticed one of the solutions is the ethnically ambiguous person. Um, so finding people who like, maybe they're Latina, maybe they're, um, you know, and so there's this like picking people who might check a handful of boxes um, from a portrayal standpoint, maybe even thinking specifically from a Gen Z standpoint, 98, do you have any, any takes on uh, featuring diversity and especially kind of this like ethnically ambiguous look? Uh, what do you guys think about that? I can start. I don't know, Brian, if you've had a thought or I can start. Cool. Um, so I'm chuckling because this is definitely something we're encountering more and more starting like late 2022, I will say. Um, when we run influencer campaigns, clients are no now more particular of like who the final roster is like, oh, do we have X percentage of X, Y and Z and so forth? Um, or I'm supposed to magically look at someone's TikTok and know what their pronouns are based on their videos and make a recommendation. So that, that's definitely, uh, I think it's a very on top of the mind thing for a lot of marketers is to really have that diverse pool of people who represent the brands, um, which I think is an awesome push, don't get me wrong, but I definitely think that a lot of it is planted or overly thought about. Um, and I think also in some capacities that some other creators or influencers or brand ambassadors who would be a really great fit for the company may not be selected uh, because they're not fit in a specific diversity pool. Um, so I think there's some pros and cons to all of that. I definitely do think like bottom line, we should also be looking at internal teams. How are we pushing, you know, diverse brand ambassadors if we're looking at the internal team and everyone is of said you know, race, gender, ethnicity. Um, so I think there's a little bit of what you don't see from the audience perspective. Um, you're like, oh my gosh, this is a really diverse company. Whereas if you're working internally and you see like everyone is a carbon copy of one another, it definitely feels a little bit uneasy knowing that you're pushing so for so much diversity publicly um, and not, you know, company-wise. So that's my hot take. Awesome. Yeah, un unscripted. That was that just came to me. So we'll get we'll get to some uh, some calmer questions. Andy, let's take an audience question. <laughs> uh, so this is from uh, audience participant. Do you think uh, different media channels affect the success of a central marketing campaign compared to a local marketing campaign? Again, do you think? different media channels affect the success of a central marketing campaign compared to a local marketing campaign. Who would like to address that? Ivy, do you want to take a stab? Different media channels. Uh, sure, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, from a technical standpoint, <laughs> yes. Uh, we get a lot of, um, you know, marketing tips sometimes on the question of, is this platform or this media more effective of what we're trying to achieve? And, and yes, of course, there are instances in which proper market research will inform you through the empirical way where your audience is. And sometimes you, if you don't have that knowledge, you're going to struggle with those results. So it, the, the, I guess the, the strategy dictates the success of X campaign as much as you are informed as to where your audiences might be. And this has also to do with um, what um, Gia was talking about just now, is in relation to that, because 
in order for a brand to analyze or if you have you know data that points to you using certain media channels to do certain things that media channel also has its own market research that tells you what type of audiences they have themselves or who is using this more than that so you have to be very very at all times analytical to have that strategic analysis in place in order for you to dictate the roi of x campaign um there is no specific formula that says for this particular campaign i should be using this particular media and therefore i'm going to have a better result uh, it doesn't work that way in our experience is is about also a b testing and you know all the best practices etc there are instances in which um you know multicultural visuals don't necessarily convey the target audience you need to sell your product and as much as we like and we especially at brand delay are huge defenders like really advocates for diversity and inclusion we're also very strategic and sometimes we have to say to brands very clearly i know you want to do this and i know you want to represent this particular audience but let me tell you this market is not buying your product this market is not going to use your services and therefore you need to target the people that you know are going to respond to your bottom line so you have to be very very sometimes even emphatic when it comes to a strategic and data-driven approach um so i don't know if that answers that particular question but there's no specific sort of formula to say this media will yield x results it has to be tested very bespoke to what your brand needs are i wonder i wonder also if it's a shift from like more traditional broadcast media to more hyper localized fragmented um digital media i mean maybe that's one way of of approaching this uh, Rich, we have a question for about Cannondale specifically. And the question is, what was the reason for the Cannondale rebrand a couple of years back? And does this help global branding? Uh, you know, so so first of all, I in my agreement, I can't really I revised and looked at my my agreement today. So I can really speak at the industry as a whole, but I can talk about that topic because uh, actually you and I have a, a shared experience. And, and you look at brands when they change their, their identity, there's, there's always a bit of confusion with consumers. You know, Reebok was a great example. They probably had in the lifespan, the lifespan of the brand, you know, say it's 40, 50 modern years, uh, probably had 40 or 50 different uh, brand marks. So, so it's a hard decision to, to change the mark. Uh, you know, when, when I walked into, I had two stints at Reebok, the second time I walked into Reebok, the, the word mark, the, the brand mark was RBK, you know, they had dropped the vowels and I walked in, in, in 2006 and realized that that was a very 2001 type of, uh, approach. So, so it's very hard. What I'd say is, is you really need to go down to simplicity. Don't be too stylized with, with your brand approach and know that that whenever you change a brand mark, you have to put double effort into it to, to make sure that the consumer is tracking, oh, that's my brand or that's the brand that I understand and, and really do due diligence against branding 101, teaching your consumers, this is our new mark. You know, when you look at FedEx uh, or all of those brands, Pepsi, when they change their brands, it's it's generally not noticeable to the consumer, you know, and uh, so that's where where you'd like to be. You know, it it occurs to me too. There's brands like I think Coca Cola came up, and Pepsi. Coca Cola is a very they have the same mark. If you look at the right. trademark registration from right. the 1800s, yeah, their, their mark yep. is yep. exactly the same. And you have brands like Pepsi, Coca Cola, historically very timeless brand. It doesn't exist in any particular period. Um, versus Pepsi, which is very much a brand that's of the now. And I think it's just an interesting choice that brands have to make is how modern and relevant do they want to be, which comes, I think, at a cost on the other end sometimes as well. Um, we're going to switch, we're going to switch back a little bit to, uh, to technology and something that, um, I think has been a, a buzzword. We talked a little bit about chat GPT and AI, but also the metaverse, um, so the metaverse, obviously, companies like Meta have changed their um, entire brand to to plant a seed 
uh, to, to indicate their commitment to this area. And the metaverse presumably is like knows no um, global bounds. Todd, what's what's up with the metaverse and how should we start to think about this in terms of global branding, local branding? Does this even fit within either of those constructs? Sure, yeah. Um, the, the term right metaverse is so thrown around. It's really right, just the internet, right? It really is the internet. Um, and it just has this new uh, coat of paint on it, if you will. But if you look at like, I guess, like people want to look at like Roblox for a great example as what maybe quote unquote, the real metaverse could be in the future, um, where you then see other big fashion brands, like maybe a Gucci, I think maybe Adidas did stuff, but there's all these different brands that have big marketing budgets, obviously experimenting in that space to see exactly, you know, what could come from it. And I think what also gets looped into the, like the, uh, within the metaverse world is the whole NFT craze, right? How are you going to have these collectibles, these digital type of collectibles, that could be uh, shared and sold, right? Um, <clears throat> and provide value to the end user in some way. Um, but for me, I can definitely be very honest that I've never purchased an NFT. I've only been gifted an NFT. And I have yet to really explore the quote unquote metaverse for myself. Um, just because I, I don't know. I, I just never found a value for me, at least, um, to be uh, using one Roblox um or any of these other types of tools but um i definitely see that there's a interesting i guess if you're a large enough brand there's no reason why you shouldn't be experimenting within that space right because obviously all these different types of little experiments help give you more of an idea of what is to come in the future when it comes to augmented reality where i think is really going to be the big uh selling point for what the quote-unquote metaverse will entail vr is pretty much dead no one wants to be stuck on a with a headset you know for you know even 10 minutes of their day, right? But when you start seeing maybe like a big, um, like Apple, hopefully this year, maybe it's gonna be next year, we'll see when they come out with their glasses, that's really gonna change, shift everything. And that's when you're gonna have these different big corporations that have been diving into these 3D volumetric type worlds um, really pay off. All that, all that uh, R&D that they've been spending for the last few years working in the space, you know, using their normal cameras, right? To be able to play these different like tabletop games, or you know, just really just using the camera on the phone will help lend itself into when you actually have that strapped to your to your face and you're wearing these glasses that are allowing you to have that augmented experience and um, a new type of way of engaging with a brand. So you could be a, a an automobile company, right? Using these augmented glasses to maybe create your customize your next new car, or it could be a Cannondale, right? It could be a bike company. It could be a, a glasses company. Any type of product company where you're using quote unquote AR, you know, using AR to be able to personalize something and really get more of a touch and feel to it. So it's not just a 2D object that you're trying to customize on a website. Like if you go to Nike um, and you try to make, a, you know, customize your new shoes, your new kicks. Um, but now you're actually seeing it. You can play around with it. You can, you know, see it within a 3D uh, environment. I think it's, it makes it really more, I don't know. I think it's just a very interesting way to to play around with a brand and have fun with it. I think brands want to be seeing their consumers having more fun with their brand however they can and meet them where they are. And so I, that's like an over-explained way of saying like, I haven't, I'm not really fully sold on what the quote unquote metaverse is, but I definitely see augmented reality becoming a big, um, big player, um, a new type of technology that a lot of brands should be getting uh, more engaged in. You know, I could I could add to that, or I could add on to the NFT part, uh, especially because for me, especially in, in a brand, you want to make sure that the things that you're giving your consumers are not novelty, that that they have lasting added value to your consumers. For me, you know, yes, can we do uh, a bike design that's a special NFT, something that you can use in Zwift or something like that? That would be amazing. But also in my industry of of bikes that are sold and bought and resold. You could do uh, a bike provenance through through blockchain uh, with an NFT. So so it adds both uh, you know some novelty, some design, some lifestyle credentials, but it also adds value to the consumer at the end of the day when they go or buy to buy their bike. Definite hot hot take from Todd though. VR is dead. That one uh, that one is an interesting one. I do I do think though I'm sort of gonna gonna draw a couple connections here though. I think Celine talked about working in global environments. Celine, you're in where now? 
Malaysia. In Malaysia, rich, you're not in LA. Just outside of New York. Outside of New York. And so one of the things I know that um, Quest, the Quest 3 is going to have a thinner form factor. And I do wonder if there's a world in which we will work more side by side as opposed to on Zoom, a, a 2D interface versus a 3D interface. Um, and and I, maybe another question which we don't even have to talk about now is this return to office versus uh, staying at home. If we stay at home, it does open opportunities for us to work in more immersive ways together. So I do wonder if VR may not be dead for work applications. Um, also, I do, and I, this is like the worst thing you ever hear. And I've been in so many meetings when someone says, but my son, and you're like, oh my God, please. Uh, but my son does love his VR headset. So um, I am curious where, and also sales of Dramamine are through the roof ever since VR came out. So people are hellbent on getting over the motion sickness so much so that they are taking motion sickness um, medications. A <laughs> uh, quick question, Matt, um, just to put it back at you. Uh, how many hours a week does your son use VR headset? 15. A lot. Really? Yeah. Wow. He's in it. He plays okay. this he plays a game where he actually has a community. As a community, it's called um Gorilla Tag, and you assume the identity of a gorilla and you run around these virtual worlds. He also works up quite a sweat, so I'm glad that he's uh not couch potatoing super hard. But he play he spends many, many hours on this game and he and he longs for it. He loves this, he loves this game. But he also really has like he he loves being in a virtual headset. For him, it's it's a place that he really enjoys. Uh, Gorilla Tag also, he said when he started playing it like a year ago, it had a couple thousand people. Now it's like 100,000 people. So the community continues to grow there as well. I just went on their website and the quick brand, what, what they, uh, the fir first message that they tell you is reject humanity. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they're teaching your kids, man. <laughs> this is sick. this all reminds me of the second coming of second life remember in the, the mid 2000s i was just thinking that andy yep it didn't go anywhere but now it's back <laughs> so i'm curious or we're curious uh gia selena brown you must work with companies that are exploring the use of roblox or metaverse or um augmented reality is that a safe assumption yeah i mean we've heard it a lot from not only like some of our clients, but also um, from other agencies like, oh, like what are you doing to explore the metaverse? What are you, uh, what do you think about um, AR, VR, um, NFTs, blockchain, stuff like that. Um, and it's definitely become a buzzword. And I feel like on the ground, what we've observed kind of talking with Gen Zs and Gen Alphas, um, yeah, just teams in general is that Currently, like the metaverse is like very um, vague in terms of its definition and no one's really like super excited to be on it and in terms of like metaverse as a concept. Um, but there are certain like games like Roblox, like Fortnite um, that have had like very good online communities that um, people continue to go back to to kind of find um, something that they enjoy as well. And then to touch on the um, kind of gorillas um, aspect, I feel like a big trend that we're seeing for um, Gen Zs and younger is the fact that they kind of don't want to be themselves online. I feel like there's like a novelty for virtual worlds like the metaverse, where you can be someone else, you can be something not human. Um, and then the online kind of virtual space kind of unlocks that possibility, which I feel like is a great appeal to um, our generation, especially since we've been exposed to online factors for so long. So I think that's definitely something that um, brands should try to explore. But in terms of the applications um, that it has today, um, it definitely feels like a novelty. And as more brands kind of hop on, um, I feel like that novelty quickly wears off and it, it either becomes something that um, we expect from brands or something that kind of fades away eventually. So um, that's that's kind of what we see from our perspective. Continuing on the on the tech trend, tech topic, 
Here's a question from the audience for Todd. Todd, do you think universities should be keeping on the AI metaverse bandwagon sooner than, or jumping on the AI uh, metaverse bandwagon sooner than later? Will it make a difference to Gen Alpha whether a university is tech trending or not? Uh, here's my hot take. Um, for sure, universities, like we just had an event I helped curate um, at USC Zandenberg School of Journalism and uh, New Media, and it was focusing on um, a chatbot wrote my, what was it? A chatbot wrote my home, uh, wrote my essay, and then an AI took my job. I think it was like the quick, witty, you know, uh, tag of mine that probably ChatGPT wrote for them. Um, and really the consensus of it all was focusing on, one, definitely, don't be like New York uh, school system or other different regions where they banned it completely. They're just like, we're not going to use this and be very res uh, resistive, um, resisting that new technology. Um, I think that schools need to figure out their policies right around how AI is, when AI can be used and when AI cannot be used is exactly because I feel like it's definitely be considered a quote unquote, a, a kind of a form of plagiarism for sure. If it's not your own words, if you're not actually learning it, then that what's the point, right? Um, and so definitely you're seeing teachers now, especially there's a, a professor over in Morton School of Business where he has entire, he got ahead of it, right? So he has a new policy about using AI. He actually is encouraging students to use AI in certain types of assignments. And then you have to talk about it. And then also there's other teachers that are making, um, um, having you do more handwritten essays in class, less take home essay type of work. Most stuff has to be done in, in school, in the actual classroom itself and more, um, more uh, talks instead of just actual writing. And so everyone's trying out, right? This is all very the wild west, the genie's out of the bottle, it's never going away, right? Things like chat, GBT are just gonna get better. There'll be new types of tools, right? Um, but then there's also, so to really answer it, I feel teachers really need to figure out how to incorporate into the curriculum uh, using chat, GBT or these types of technology, these large language models um, within their curriculum. Um, but making sure that how they do it is in such a way that you're not losing the ability for students to become better critical thinkers because that's the biggest fear i always have is that similar to like when you know you use a calculator in certain math tests right sometimes you got to show your work right no calculator to use those type of scenarios i think are going to be very relatable to today with chat gbt and these ai tools it's like when and when not you can use them and then also show your work right can you actually explain this topic in depth or no you didn't so how the heck did you know about the Cold War and write this beautiful essay about a six page paper, you know, you seven year, seventh grader, right? It's like, there's no way in heck you wrote this or your pop, maybe your parents wrote it, but nope, today it's the AI that wrote it. And so I feel like um, definitely getting ahead of it and getting, uh, figuring out good policies is very necessary. They shouldn't be resistant. And when it comes to the metaverse angle of it all, again, it's such a buzzword. Like, what are we really talking about there? Um, I think though that the future, is probably not going to be as much. This is, yeah, this is my hot take. I don't think the future is really going to be about like these uh, alpha, what's called these uh, gen alphas going to four year colleges anymore. I think you're going to be learning. You're gonna having an AI assistant that's going to teach you what you want to know in the manner that you want it, that the, the manner that you can actually consume it. You're going to be learning through MOOCs, right? Through like maybe going through community college type programming. You're not going to be coming out of college, right, with debt. Instead, you're going to be using that to start a new business or be able to take on that apprenticeship. Um, and so I really, as much as like I loved US going to USC, I went there for film school, so I went there for a really good reason. Um, I really do think that the future does, there's a lot going to be a lot more opportunities. These universities obviously are never going away. LMU is not going away. I'm not trying to say scare anyone, but I think there's gonna be a lot more opportunities, a lot more variety of ways for people to learn and get jobs and the flourish in life in the way that they want it. Thank you. Because I was, I was ready to like leave my job and just yes, or something. But I just sold all my VR and college stock. So, um, <laughs> thanks, Todd. You know what I'm hearing this, though. In in a way, I think this topic, other topics. It's, I think we're talking about a lot about control, right? Is like how much can we control what people are doing? And I think in a lot of ways, the genie's out of the bottle. People kind of know what's up. Um, I do though think simultaneously that what people want and what people need aren't always the same thing. There's great studies about people want a lot of choice. When they get a lot of choice, they hate it and they get paralyzed. Um, and so I think we as leaders and administrators have to help people deal with this choice and deal with this new world 
that we're living in. Sticking on the topic of control, um, maybe we'll open this one up with, with Ivy, is that, you know, the historical approach for, for brand marketing was come up with a big hook or handle, and then you you message that hook or handle um, as often as you can, as consistently as you can, and that's how we build a brand. So example is uh, American Express, don't leave home without it, with the right colors and the right, um, you know, that consistency of message. But now we're shifting to a world of influencers, micro-influencers, fragmented markets, especially with influencers, like it's their brand. We're just kind of like along for the ride there a little bit. Um, how should marketers think about this notion of control and influence and brand as we um, sort of enter this next version of the of marketing? Um, well, super interesting again. And, and, and usually um, it comes down to brand alignment. I feel that a lot of missed opportunities and a lot of the things that when brands don't get it right, has to do with just being on a fear of missing out situation and oh, such and such, we should grab such and such or we should do this and this. So everybody going out there with finger in the air because everybody's jumping and, you know, after the same thing. We get that question a lot, especially from startups. Oh, is this something that we should do? Oh, is this something that we should consider? If we're going to, especially when they do market entry here, uh, oh, LA is such a different market. Do we, you know, is this something that you, you feel, you know, the, the market is true or should we? No. Um, I feel that from our experience, it is important to be very discerning when it comes to the type of um, influencers that we enlist, uh, you know, and, and be really, really sort of in the process of betting how even down the line a potential affiliation or association or collaboration or partnership with influencers can be detrimental or a positive experience to the brand. I feel that sometimes in order to achieve certain goals, in order to turn around or just turn in some ROIs, um, you know, what we call the, the type of leadership that doesn't necessarily do uh, QC, <laughs> sort of on brand implementation, can have a negative effect, it, you know, if you just want to do a little bit of everything of what is out there with everyone that is out there. Um, there is some education that needs to take place when it comes to understanding not just what we, what you guys just talked about, the metaverse and, you know, artificial intelligence and technologies that can aid marketing and how ethically can those be used to even be equitable in the offering or expansion of the storytelling of that brand is the same with influencers so uh, i mean i just need to say more work needs to be done uh, when it comes to decision making processes when it comes to uh, deploying campaigns that actually include x or y influencer for x or y purposes or um goals um so yeah it's it's, it's in, in in our experience from what we see uh, there are a lot of questions still, even though the influencer type of marketing is kind of being there and done that in a way, uh, people still get it wrong occasionally. And with the exception of the mega brands that are exceptional in some cases, that, that they go very right, um, the next tier of brands that are in the making to be or to be at the next level, I still have to work through uh, some of those decisions in in order to to get that right. So, awesome. ninety eight folks, do you have any perspectives on this? The issue of control, trying to control your narrative when with so many different influences and um, you know points of view out there. What do you think? I feel like we, um, from what we observed, uh, some of our kind of Gen Z attitudes is like somewhat of like a late stage capitalism era. And we have these attitudes that like, oh, like these um, legacy brands have been advertising for us for so long and they've traditionally controlled the narrative. But um, with social media, like that kind of um, equilibrium has shifted and like almost anyone who's like an average Joe can now become like a star influencer with like a viral video and kind of change the tra trajectory of certain brands or products. Um, we feel like 
Um, that's definitely something that, that has shifted and has given power back to the people, as well as kind of just um, rising up on social media and having these kind of um, digital, um, I guess like campaigns against um, some brands that has definitely kind of shifted that power as well. So um, we feel like it's definitely um, become something that brands should lean into and really um, allow people to kind of control the narrative. I think, um, you know, one of traditionally, um, one of the most powerful pieces of marketing has been word, word of mouth. And I feel like using some of these new mediums like micro influencers, it really allows them to kind of control their own narrative and let their products and services speak for themselves. And I feel like that has kind of helped um, bring power back to the user and have them kind of make their, their own decisions. So uh, I think that's something that um, we try to encourage brands to do, to give a little bit of the control back to their audience that they're trying to um, collaborate with. And it has um, definitely paid off in some aspects. Like um, we feel like um, people who are able to kind of interact with the brand in that way feel like they have some sort of investment in the brand and they're able to kind of build that brand together. Nice. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Rich, how do you, how do you how do you leverage or think think about and leverage without kind of giving away anything you're not supposed to give away? But um, you know, managing and control manage doing a well managed brand consistent brand yet leveraging influence, which is a, a loss of control in a lot of instances. Yeah, sure. I, I think a lot of times you have to think of it like the tide. You know, the tide's going to come in and the tide's going to go out and you're not going to have 100% of control uh, the way you want, nor, nor sh should you desire that. You should have, uh, again, you know, the essence of your brand should be controlled. Uh, how it's interpreted uh, is, is, you know, is open for debate. Uh, one of the examples is, you know, in cycling in, in our company, like, you know, the paint colors are, you know, that's our brand, you know, the brand is on the frame, you know, it's not the components and things like that. And, and a month ago I encountered uh, someone who painted our frame, really redesigned it, really redesigned the logos. And one of my employees said to me, well, I don't think we should put this up. And my feeling was like, no, they took our brand and celebrated our brand, allow them to, to let's celebrate them back. We're not uh, you know, changing our brand, but we're allowing people to play with the brand. And I, I think you have to do that. Otherwise you're, you're tired, boring and old. Awesome. Let's, let's take a, go ahead. Ivy. No, I said, look at the Lakers, all those logos, all those things. And, um, just a fun fact. Um, I actually went to do some research myself, um, uh, for people who submit creative works just to tell the, the Lakers in particular, Hey, um, we think you should have this. We think you should use X and Y. And, you know, they're very specific as to how they control the visuals and, and how they portray, uh, you know, all their elements, et cetera. It's fascinating um, just to see that, that piece of language um, when it comes to Iron Fist control of, of the brand. It, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> you know, we're... Um... Sadly, we're coming up on six o'clock, uh, Cali time. So we're gonna have to wrap things up, but we have a couple of audience questions that are directly related to this um, line of thought. The first is, what are your top examples of a brand that changed things up and took the risk without consumers freaking out too much? Can you think of an example of a brand that changed things up and took a risk without consumers totally freaking out? I have to say Facebook. Um, Meta, they just went and did what they needed to do. And uh, obviously it is arguably the biggest brand in the world, but um, no one gave it a second, so, second thought. It, it was literally, well, this is Facebook with Meta and, and Facebook is now this. So that's the one that comes to mind. And then the second question is, uh, love what Brian shared. Do you think it's possible to let brand democracy happen without conflict between central versus local marketing, which kind of ties back to what Rich was mentioning, talking about with the redesigned bike? Is it possible to let brand democracy 
thrive or happen without conflict between centralized or localized strategies? I think it's definitely possible, um, but it'll probably look a little bit different from what maybe the central brand is expecting. Um, I feel like there's always going to be some certain level of conflict, but um, at the end of the day, like um, you can try to control the your brand narrative as much as you want or can, and then you kind of just have to let um, the local um, and like at the micro influencer level, let let them speak for themselves and use their voice um, to kind of further the brand. And I like what Rich said about. Um... You know, like allowing the core, the the essence of the brand to stay consistent, but letting um, letting it flourish in ways that other people wanted to, you know, want to express it. I, I think a great example of a brand that does that is Carhartt. You know, you, know, you think of, of Carhartt, how they've evolved, yet you walk into a Carhartt store in Harajuku and it definitely feels localized. It feels like it's it's got a Japanese influence in, in it. You know, they have a local design crew and things like that. So I think Carhartt's probably a good example of that. I, would, I, don't, I don't know if I'd move into the word democracy in a brand, but I, I definitely move to benign despot. You know, I definitely move into, to, you know, acknowledging and letting things happen organically and naturally that are right for the brand uh, and, and uh, have that freedom. Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, remember the Tropicana rebrand debacle when Tropicana rebranded and everyone like lost, they like went nuts. And I, I still, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't fully understand it, but it's in, we live in a time where cons people have not only a voice, but an interest in like how brands conduct themselves um, in the world, all the way down to their orange juice. And they, I think people got fired over it. Like, I literally think when they tried to do the rebrand and they tried to keep some, some elements, they jettisoned from others, uh, it led to people's firing. And like, I don't know, it wasn't a terrible rebrand. Um, but it is, it is definitely the world that we live in today where like people are going to tell you what they think. So we'd like to end it up, close it up with one final question for all of our amazing panelists. And this is from a leadership perspective. What are the top challenges facing global marketers today? For instance, is it recruiting the right talent? Is it possessing the right technical skills? Is it being curious enough to know and to really keep track of, of local trends or global trends? Let's start with uh, Ivy. What do you think? Uh, yeah, so great question. I'm going to be succinct. We did some research um, on that as well uh, on our, on our, for our annual bulletin. And uh, so there are cross-industry challenges for marketers. That means for brands. I, I wanted to briefly take 15 seconds to say that we in this space need to take our work seriously. We have skills to influence the way certain processes happen. It is on us to sort of persuade leadership that with whom we work to actually analyze these processes and make it as influential as the brands want to be globally. Uh, so from that perspective, um, you know, it is important. One of the challenges, no surprisingly, is recruiting talent. Absolutely. You want to have a good infrastructure and sometimes it's difficult because the world that we live in today dictates, uh, you know, skills that are in demand and maybe, you know, the education ecosystem in the area where you are doesn't offer those particular skills as the top of mind uh, to be nurtured within that region. So you have to look for talent elsewhere and you have to look for talent, you know, across the world and, and so forth. And there are a ton of other factors that come into that. So maintaining um, a sufficient budget came up in the top 10, generating leads, uh, finding the right tools, uh, being risk adverse. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, sort of before we close up, there's been a lot of studies on brand success and the autonomy that CMOs have, especially from mega global brands. And, you know, the, the bottom line is the, that level of autonomy will be directly correlated to, you know, how much is done for market entry in international spaces and how successful you are also depends on how much creativity you're afforded to do that as a leader. 
So, but, you know, there are a lot more, again, moving into new markets and retaining customers, retaining and training staff, choosing effective tactics and facing increased competition. That's not going away. Todd, how about you? Uh, from, a, say, a technical skill perspective, is it, um, is that a really important thing for global marketers to really just stay on top of the ever-changing world of technology? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like any skilled worker, especially marketing, um, you have to, you know, go with, you do more again, like what I was saying before, the theme is really doing more with less. Uh, so using these types of AI tools or augmented reality or these new types of technology, you know, these paradigm shifts that we're, we're facing right now, um, you have to be ahead of it all. Because if you're not, then your brand's probably going to you know, not see, be seen as innovative or uh, meeting their consumers where they are. And so I feel like every, um, whether you're a marketer or a copywriter or whatever your skilled position is, you should be learning how to use these new tools. Um, because again, like I said before, uh, if you're not, someone else will, and then that person will take your job. About uh, Bryant, Selena, and Gia, is it like, uh, are you sensing that the clients you work with are the more the ones that are more successful are they for instance staying current with political cultural um changes in consumer behavior what is it that really defines that um successful global marketer in your mind yeah i just want to echo what both todd and ivy were saying um i i think like what has helped people be really successful in the global market is flexibility um, both internally and externally. Um, like I mentioned previously, like teams are global. We need to know how to be flexible and adapt to global teams and time zones and work from home and everything. And I think like we, especially this next generation, as we continue to enter the workforce, have really powered and fueled technology in the workplace for the better um, and for the more efficient reasons. Um, Externally, I think the clients that do the best are the ones who are constantly, like you said, observing what's happening in the external market, um, not just what's happening in their specific niche market, but what's happening in the entire world. Um, I feel like that is one of the key things of the clients who are consciously thinking about strategy and optimizing and improving. Um, yeah, so it's really being intentional about understanding um, you know, your audience while staying true to your brand at the same time, like he, as a marketer, you can't please everyone. Like the world is way too big to be pleasing everyone. So like know what your target goals are, know what, you know, how you're going to get there, know the audience um, and continue to evolve and innovate your strategies in order to reach those people. I think Gio wanted to add on, so I'll pass it over here. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of go back to what Ivy said earlier about, you know, what makes a brand successful, a global brand successful. It's that really understanding what your mission and purpose is as a brand. We all know like everything is changing so fast with social media, trends, social issues. So much is going on that it's, I guess, a, a common error for brands to just try to, you know, keep up and, and latch onto the latest trend. But Something that we've seen with Gen Z is that they really like see through that because it's it's just performative and it, it's not true to your brand. And so I think when it comes to staying relevant in the market while staying true to your brand, like Celine was saying, it all starts from understanding like your brand purpose. And especially when it comes to like political, social, cultural issues, a lot of Gen Zs have no trust in brands to follow through. So when you're dealing with those current issues, the most important thing, not just to add on to the conversation, but to follow through with your brand actions as it aligns with your mission. So I think that's what makes a successful global brand. Stay true to your brand, but trying to remain curious, open-minded, uh, but not being, um, you know, kind of performative or doing it for disingenuous reasons. Rich, how about you? Well, I think for me, first of all, you know, there's there's the good and the bad. You know, I, I try to pride myself in in knowledge of popular culture. I think brands that that become 
you mentioned Oatly as we were talking earlier this week. And brands that become global brands, what I would say is brands need to become lifestyle brands. And in my mind's eye, to become a lifestyle brand, you have to know popular culture, whether it's music, art, film, what's happening in street art and things like that. Layer on top of that, what's happening in technology of uh, social media and media channels. And then, and then layer on that because all the other CMOs, your, your job is always e-commerce too. So, so understanding technology, whether it's in the cart, you know, it, it becomes uh, unfathomable. So, so there's two or three things. One is like grab your area of expertise. And, and for me, I, I enjoy popular culture. So the second thing is trust your subject matter experts on your team uh, and, and as they're discerning and always constantly push them to, in, in the, the book of Nate Silver, discern the signal from the noise. You know, what are these technologies that have longevity? What are these technologies that provide value? And on the other side, what are these technologies that are more novelty? You know, that, that somebody's walked into a meeting and they've discovered a, a new media channel and, and we should be there. Well, you know, put that through the acid test and, and do that. So um, definitely having a team that, that, that you trust uh, in their areas of, of expertise. Thank you. Well, it's, it's been a super fascinating discussion of how complex it can truly be to be uh, a brand on a global scale. Matt and I, we thank you. Yeah, it's been great. We'll turn it back over. And again, thanks for uh, the support. Thanks for our panelists for for taking time out of their days. Um, for all the for the LMU folks for for putting this together and promoting. I'm gonna turn it over to Young Sun say uh, to send us out. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Andy, Matt. Thank you so much for moderating such a stimulating and intriguing panel discussion. It's been almost an hour and a half. We still have about 40 people attending this webinar. So I can tell the audience is very much engaged and we can continue this conversation probably throughout the night. Well, if you do not mind, I want to piggyback on Andy's final question. We have many students attending this webinar today. Um, other than the, something that each of you mentioned about tech savvy, flexibility, and et cetera. I'm wondering, and particularly those uh, you know, proud LMU alumni, what do you think would be the most important sort of skills and competence that makes you successful? And you want to recommend um, your you know, friends, LMU friends, who's attending this webinar so that you know, they can work for the company conducting business uh, in the global market, or they can start their own company um, as you did. Um, so do you have any few additional skills, competencies that you like to have your LMU friends uh, work on before they graduate? Young said, do you want people to submit something in the chat or? No, no, no. I'm, I'm just asking that uh, the, the panelists, and, and particularly Celine, Gia, and Brian. I can start. Green star. Um, so I guess when we first started our company, um, we really didn't have much to work with, um, not even like a physical office space. So uh, I think one of the values um, that we pride ourselves on and I feel like our generation prides ourselves on is kind of resourcefulness, um, especially using the inter internet to our advantage um, and kind of using the tools of the internet um, to our advantage. So I feel like thinking about like alternative solutions um, constantly to like even like common problems or common solution to an unconventional problem, I feel like that definitely um, is something that has been really helpful for us in thinking of the way to kind of navigate and start our company. Um, so I think that's something that is a skill that um, people should definitely um, kind of train and hone. Um, I definitely, I wanna add to that. Um, 
the sounds like a given, but be nice to people is a really great advice. I think when we started out, we really leaned on a lot of people to help us. Um, Matt and Andy were two people who definitely helped us get on our feet and continue to do so. And it's because we built good relationships with them. Um, and also just like your peers. I mean, there's people we've called on to help with photo shoots or video shoots, um, whatever you might need. LMU students are so talented and so multifaceted, like keep doing your craft, keep exploring new, you know, hobbies, be nice to people. You never know, like you'll get a gig from your friend or, you know, want to work with someone from your alma mater. And yeah, I, I think the the Lion family is very close. So um, I think we, as three co-founders from LMU, really appreciated all the support from LMU and the students who go there. All right. Well, on behalf of Andy and I, who are, we've actually been together this whole time. So. Um... <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. Again, uh, Ivy, Rich, Todd, Celine, Gia, and Brian. I can't thank you enough for sharing your experiences and insights with us about this timely and important topic. I know some of you have joined this webinar from different time zones. I also would like to thank all of you who joined this webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. LMU side will be back with another program on global sustainability in April, 2023. Until then, I hope that you will all stay safe and healthy before you leave. I would appreciate it if you complete a short survey about this webinar. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.